Now, we don't hear a lot about it publicly, but on January 12, 1984, the state conducts a John Doe proceeding on the Starkey Swenson disappearance. A John Doe proceeding is a unique element of Wisconsin law, which allows investigators to file a complaint with the judge stating that there's reason to believe a crime has been committed. There's no jury, and the outcome of the hearing does not lead to arrest or imprisonment. Instead, the judge rules whether there's enough evidence to say that a crime has been committed, and in some cases, whether there's enough evidence to charge an individual with the crime. If the state then decides to charge that person, the case must still go through standard preliminary hearings in court before the accused is bound over for trial. You might wonder why the state would conduct a John Doe proceeding if the outcome really only tells you the same information that you'd learn at a preliminary hearing, whether or not there's enough evidence to have a trial. But there are some interesting advantages of a John Doe hearing. Yeah, that's right, there are. In a John Doe proceeding, there are really two unique benefits for the state. First, this is a proceeding in front of the court. That means the state has the ability to subpoena witnesses who might not otherwise be willing to provide details on the case. They can ask for witnesses to a potential crime, or even the individual possibly connected to the crime, to provide information, documents, or any other evidence to the court. If they refuse to comply, the court can compel the testimony under threat of contempt of court. The second benefit for the state is, unlike a typical jury trial, the state is not required to disclose its evidence to the defense team. There really is no defense team since no one has been charged with a crime. Because of this, the state has the ability to gather evidence it might not otherwise have been able to obtain without having to tip its hand, so to speak. So the state files a complaint to the court for a John Doe hearing in the Swenson case, and they're calling the proceeding with John C. Andrews as their person of interest. Now, we only know about this hearing because it comes up at a later date. John Doe proceedings are typically kept secret from the public, but we're discussing it now as if it's the timeline of this case. So they're looking into John C. Andrews. They've got his vehicle at the crime lab. They've got whatever other information was given to them, which prompted their search warrant in the first place. And now they've got the ability to sit Andrews down in court and ask him to testify under oath. And the state asks him all about the night of Swenson's disappearance. Under oath, Andrews insists that he did not see Swenson that night. He does tell investigators that he was at the home of his ex-wife, Claire Andrews, on the night that Starkey disappeared but that he left her home in the evening and went to a bar near Omro, Wisconsin, which is about a 30-minute drive away. It's also in this John Doe hearing that we learn a neighbor reported seeing Andrews thoroughly cleaning his car the day after Swenson disappeared. In response to this, Andrews testified initially that he doesn't believe he cleaned his car. Then he says that maybe he did because he picked up a hitchhiker who had dog poop on his foot. And that's about the extent of the information we learned from the John Doe hearing. As you mentioned, we only even know this much after it's revealed during a later trial. We can assume, though, that either the judge ruled there was not enough evidence to prove a crime had been committed, or that the state determined its case was too weak, as no charges are filed following the John Doe proceeding. In July 1984, Lois Swenson and her family do something else that was somewhat unusual. They announce their plans to hold a funeral service for Starkey Swenson, despite the fact he is yet to be missing for a year and the court has not ruled him legally dead. As you mentioned earlier, per Wisconsin law, unless there's evidence proving foul play, a missing person can't be legally ruled dead until that individual has been missing for seven years. When asked about this, Lois Swenson states, quote, In our hearts, we know he's dead. And she cites the many family and community members who have attested to it being entirely out of Starkey's character to disappear of his own free will. The funeral takes place at the family's church on July 16th. I mean, I can see why they would want to have the funeral service. The family was looking for closure, and as you mentioned, his disappearance was totally out of character, which led them to believe that he must be dead. According to some news reports from the time, it also seems like the funeral service was aimed at helping to end the spread of rumors, including that Starkey had run away to a new life. According to his family, at the time, They felt like they were in an awkward situation. The police had asked them not to comment on the search for Starkey, but people had questions. By holding a funeral service, it seems the family was hoping to put it all behind him. It really is a horrible thing to consider, 
this family had lost all hope of finding Starkey, and they needed a way to end this chapter of their lives. Yeah, that's a really good point. The family is in an extremely tough situation here. Of course, somewhere in their hearts, they're harboring some small sliver of hope, but also they're realizing that they do need to get some closure in order to have any chance of moving on. And as you point out, this is a small community. An event like Starkey's disappearance is a massive local news story, and it's prone to speculation and rumors on an incredible scale, especially as time continues to go by without a trace of his body or his whereabouts. In the midst of all this, little events do keep cropping up in the case that provide some hope of shedding new light on what happened, but none of them seem to go anywhere. For instance, on November 30th, 1984, human remains are found in McQuanago, Wisconsin, a suburb of Milwaukee roughly two hours south of the Swenson's home. After a sketch artist produces a rough estimation of how the individual may have looked in life, police are notified the remains show similarities to Starkey Swenson. Okay, so I'm looking at this artist's rendering, and I've got to be honest with you, I have no idea what they see that looks at all like Starkey Swenson. Yeah, I 100% agree. So the police head down to McQuanago to investigate the remains, and they learn pretty quickly that there's almost no chance that they could be the body of Starkey Swenson. The forensic examiner in Milwaukee comes back with a report that the body's likely been in the brush for two to three years, and Starkey's been missing for just over one year at this point. There's still a pretty big margin of error when it comes to trying to determine time since death, as other factors could impact the condition of a body that's been exposed to the Wisconsin elements. But this seems to indicate an unlikely possibility that it's a match. Additionally, measurements were taken of the remains that revealed the individual was likely around five foot seven inches tall. And all the reports on Starkey Swenson show that he's either five foot nine or five foot ten. The final and confirming element that we're not dealing with Starkey Swenson's remains, where a dental exam, which indicates the McQuanago individual appeared to have lower jaw dentures, which Starkey Swenson just didn't have. These are the types of little possibilities police investigate throughout the course of a missing person case, normal police work. But they're also the types of little elements of hope that take a toll on the family and on the community. Since this is such a large case, the local news jumps all over any possible lead. There are multiple reports about a possible connection between the bodies, and you've got to imagine this, and others like it, get people pretty excited before they eventually receive the final word that there's not a link in the cases. Yeah, so for the next several years, it's really just these little leads that we hear reported in the case, and nothing ever comes to them. There are reports of another possible connection to a body found all the way in New Jersey, which is then disproved. There are even some stories passed around that the police are receiving tips submitted by psychics. It gets to the point that the police respond in the media to state that they're not interested in hearing so-called psychic evidence. It's fair to say that the Starkey Swenson case is officially cold. It's important to note at this point that the case is still a missing persons investigation. The police have stated in interviews that foul play has not been ruled out, And we also know they held a John Doe proceeding earlier that year. But Swenson's disappearance has not been officially classified as a murder or the result of any other criminal action. This is noteworthy as it might help explain the next six years. It's not that the case is closed. We know the police continue to revisit it from time to time and when new facts emerge. But we also know, based on the classification, that they may not be dedicating the same level of resources and time that might be diverted to solve a murder in the county. We, of course, can't say this for sure, but I do think it's worth mentioning. What we can say for sure is that not much emerges in the case at all between late 1984 and November 1990, six years later. When you look at media coverage, police notes, and statements by the police, it's clear that the case is open but stagnant. In fact, In a 1988 report on unsolved cases, Detective Ron Doyle states, quote, there haven't been many calls in the past year or so, end quote. On November 19, 1990, just over seven years since Starkey Swenson went missing, a Winnebago County judge officially declares him dead in accordance with the Wisconsin statute from 1872, which requires a seven-year waiting period before a missing individual can be presumed dead. As part of the proceeding, Detective Ron Doro highlights that the case had been covered by two national television programs specializing in finding missing persons, all with no result. 
When asked if he thinks Starkey Swenson is alive, Doyle responds, quote, it is my belief that he is not, end quote. It's now August 1993. Three more years have passed with no updates, and we've reached the dawn of a new decade in the Swenson investigation. Winnebago County District Attorney Joseph Paulus marks the 10-year point by stating, quote, It's still an open case. If any new leads surface, we'll respond accordingly. He later points out that while a detective is still assigned to the case, quote, with the passage of time, there's less work for that investigator to do. Little does everyone know, in less than a month's time, everything will change. On September 16, 1993, 10 years and 34 days after Starkey Swenson went missing, John C. Andrews is arrested and charged with his murder. Join us next time as we investigate this sudden break in the case and hear more details from the night of August 13, 1983. Do you want to know more about the Starkey Swenson story? Visit our website at frozentundrapodcast.com and be sure to follow our social media channels on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube for additional information, behind the scenes footage, and more. We will continue to post insider content and updates as this real time investigation progresses. We'd like to take a moment to thank those who helped us compile information on this case, including the Winnebago County Sheriff's Department, newspapers.com, and individual citizens who've shared their knowledge. Our theme music was created by Mario Cole 06 and is available for download from Pixabay.